Hey YouTube, Ethan here. Today I'm going to talk about infinite storage solutions in Oxygen not included. This video idea was suggested by a fan of the channel, so if you have a video idea, please feel free to leave it in the comments below, and I can try to get to it as soon as possible. Infinite storage solutions is a gray area for many people because you are basically manipulating the game mechanics in order to get this to work. But because Oxygen Not Included is a single player game, I don't look down upon those that do or those that want to learn how. There are some very efficient builds, like the Hydra, that you can create using the same concept that I'm about to show you here. And I think as long as that you're having fun and having a good time in the game, then that's all that matters, especially if it's single player. The mechanic that you're manipulating is the tile system. Each tile in the game can only be occupied by one type of substance, whether it's a solid, liquid, gas, or vacuum. As you can see here, this liquid tile of water does not occupy the entire tile. However, even though it looks like there's oxygen present here, there actually isn't. There's oxygen above the liquid tile, but both of these tiles below the oxygen have only water present. The animation simply makes it look like there's oxygen because the amount of water that's occupying these tiles is very low, so it gives feedback to the player that there's not much water present on these tiles. In some infinite storage systems, you're using this knowledge to your advantage by displacing a liquid or a gas vent tile with a different type of substance that you intend on storing, but not enough of that substance to cause the vent to overpressure. You're also taking advantage of the mechanic that causes different types of substances to displace each other when they're moving around on the map. And this will be more evident in something like the compressor solution. Technically, this tile mechanism is what makes efficient oxygen and hydrogen separation possible in a SPOM, because when hydrogen occupies the top layer of a SPOM, oxygen can no longer take the place of these hydrogen tiles. Meanwhile, the hydrogen that comes out of the electrolyzer has nowhere to go except the nearest similar tile, which is the hydrogen above, and this is what keeps the separation constant in a SPOM. You'll never see oxygen in this part of the SPOM except for when you first boot it up and you have oxygen trapped in here from when you built the SPOM. Likewise, you'll never see hydrogen at this part of the SPOM because hydrogen will naturally float up to the top and it will be unable to displace the oxygen that is already occupying this space. So let's take a look at some other methods that we can use for infinite storage in oxygen not included. We're going to start with one of the easiest ones and that's solid storage. Solid storage is often forgotten about when we're discussing infinite storage solutions in oxygen not included. And this is because people are generally pretty content with putting solids inside of a storage bin. Now, of course, this works perfectly fine, and there's pretty much nothing wrong with this, except that it's going to take up a lot of space, especially if you've dug out a fair amount of your asteroid, and you're looking for a place to put all those materials that you've just dug up. A storage bin can only carry 20,000 kilograms max of the different materials that you can store throughout your asteroid. But storage bins also don't do a whole lot for your decor. They give you a very low decor rating with minus 20, which is much worse than the proposed method that I'm about to show you with the automatic dispenser. You can use an automatic dispenser instead of the storage bins for infinite storage. One of the most common and easiest methods is to simply dig a two-tile pit, fill it up with some sort of liquid that doesn't have any off-gases, such as crude oil, petroleum, or regular water, and set your automatic dispensers up to throw the materials down that pit. Now, most people will use the sweep-only option, and this will prevent duplicates that have nothing else to do that would otherwise be idle from picking up the materials in here, putting them back in the automatic dispenser, and then continuing that cycle over and over. If you use sweep-only, your duplicates will only throw things in here once. Essentially what's going to happen is I'm going to have my duplicants sweep up the ceramic and igneous rock and it's going to get added into the pile that's already existing inside this trench. You can see that the ceramic and the igneous rock that has been swept up just gets added into the existing pile. And not only does this help you save a lot of space inside of your base by not having storage bins everywhere, but it also has an impact on performance because the game doesn't have to calculate all those different storage areas where you have materials stored. Now, how much of an impact this makes may be dependent on your CPU, but it is definitely worth looking at even if you are not someone who struggles with a laggy game in the late game portion of your playthrough. The oil itself is very important because if you're storing something like slime, it's naturally going to off-gas polluted oxygen, and having it inside the crude oil essentially stops that from happening altogether. Let's take a look at three different ways that you can store water using the displacement technique. At the very top here, we have a liquid vent that is pumping water into a reservoir that has reached 10,000 or more kilograms at this point. In order for this to work, the liquid reservoir must be surrounded by airflow tiles. At a certain point, the water is going to cause pressure damage to your tiles because it cannot contain the capacity of water that you're trying to store. Airflow tiles are your only ways around this. The capacity of this water has already reached over 10,000 kilograms, and if this was surrounded by anything other than airflow tiles, it would be cracking and there will be water spilling all over your base. The airflow tiles prevents this from happening. The reason why the water is not covering the liquid vent is because there's oxygen trapped here. As you can see, there's 76 kilograms of oxygen, which is displacing any water from getting near this liquid vent. This allows the liquid vent to keep operating no matter what capacity the water level has reached down below. And this will pretty much go on forever until you run out of water to pump throughout your asteroid. 
This is the exact same setup as above, but instead of using oxygen, we're using oil. Arguably, this is a lot easier to design when you're not using sandbox mode because you can just drop a small bucket of crude oil onto this one tile, which will remain there forever because it's surrounded by airflow tiles. And then you can start pumping in water with the liquid vent. There's not enough oil on the liquid vent tile in order to overpressure the liquid vent. So the liquid vent will keep operating indefinitely and it will keep filling up this reservoir way beyond that you could normally fill it up to if this oil wasn't here. This is the exact same storage solution using a liquid displacement that I just showed you, but it's just showing that you don't need to have it surrounded by insulated tiles. You can just use airflow tiles and nothing else surrounding it. And in this case, I'm displacing the liquid vent tile using a very small drop of ethanol. This would be slightly harder to make because it would be hard to keep the ethanol in this position as you're trying to fill up this chamber with water. So this is just to show that your design can be pretty much any type of design, as long as you're following the concept of displacing the tile that the liquid vent is occupying with another type of liquid, as long as that liquid is not overpressurizing the liquid vent. And the liquid vent above is overpressurized because it's not being displaced by anything, even though it should be set to receiving water. So if you want to store infinite amount of liquids, these are the displacement techniques that you can use, either with gas or liquids. Another method for liquid infinite storage is the waterfall technique. I find the waterfall technique to be more complicated to build than the previous infinite storage techniques that we've already covered. However, there are some niche uses for it and I'm going to show you right after we go over how the waterfall method actually works. Now, I'm sure there are better ways of building the waterfall method as well. So what my goal is, is just to provide you with the basic concept of how it works so you can apply it into different situations where I find it's actually a lot more useful than a standalone storage technique. For starters, we're going to need two different types of gases. Here I'm using hydrogen and oxygen, but you can use oxygen and carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide and hydrogen or whatever you choose. The infinite storage chamber still has to be built out of airflow tiles, but because we're going to do something unique with the gases, as in creating a separation from the inlet and the infinite storage chamber with gases in this location, we're going to use manual airlock in order to prevent these gases from entering the infinite storage chamber when we're trying to place them. The manual airlocks function similarly to airflow tiles in that they won't receive overpressure damage if there's too much liquid held in this chamber. There are three main stages to the waterfall method, and that's the chamber itself, which we've already discussed, the inlet where the water comes in, and this also needs to be specifically designed so that the gases that are trapped in here do not flow outwards through the inlet. This means that the tile next to the gases and the tile after that need to have liquid in them, otherwise the gases that we place in these two tiles will simply trade places with the liquid and flow out of the inlet. One of the main things that I like to do in order to get this chamber up and running is to prime the infinite storage chamber before the building is finished. In this case, I'm simply going to use sandbox mode to brush in some liquid Liquid, but in a real game, you would input liquid in this area and then close off the top completely. This will seal this chamber in its entirety so there's no gaps. I'm not sure if this is particularly necessary, but this is what seems to work for me. The next step is to get the gases to flow all the way to the end of their respective pipes. Note that this will not happen unless there's an inlet at both of these ends. And the easiest way to do this is to just install a gas bridge, which will allow both the hydrogen and the oxygen to flow to the very end of the pipe. And that's how we're going to input the gases into these two tiles. The third step is to start the water flow. Once the water flow starts, I'm going to make sure that this tile is completely full of water before I move on to the next step to release the gases. While that's flowing up, I'll explain how we're going to release the gases. It's actually quite easy. We're simply going to queue up the deconstruct command on the hydrogen gas first. Of course, in a real base, your duplicates would have access to this area. So in this case, we're just going to spawn a duplicate in so they can perform the task for us. So we spawn someone in and here comes bubbles. She's going to destroy both pipes and they're going to release their respective gases. Once that happens, there's going to be hydrogen gas and oxygen gas trapped in these two tiles, which is going to allow the inlet from the water to continue flowing continuously without getting backed up. As you can see, this creates a little bit of a waterfall, and that's why it's called the waterfall infinite storage technique. I'm not sure if that's actually what it's called by the community, but this is how it seems to work, so that's what I like to call it. Now we can continuously spawn water up in this area where the inlet is, and it will continue to flow into the infinite storage chamber. Of course, we can also deconstruct both of the gas bridges, in this case, just delete them in sandbox mode. And this will help your... Well, let's delete bubbles before she gets stressed out. And this will help keep the area a little bit more tidy, but you can leave them in there as well. So like I said, this is not a technique that I like to use. And if I was to use one, it definitely wouldn't be the waterfall because I find this can be kind of finicky to set up. But I needed to show this concept before we move on to the next step. And that is how to apply this technique to an infinite storage water geyser. The waterfall technique for the water geyser works exactly the same way. We basically have two tiles of different gases that are creating a separation from the inlet where the water is coming from, 
to the infinite storage area where the water is being held. In here, I'm also using hydrogen gas and oxygen. Of course, oxygen is naturally going to find its way in here because as you build this geyser setup, you're going to have oxygen around your base. So the hydrogen you will need to import manually. I think the easiest way to do this would be to simply put a gas vent here and then send one tile of hydrogen into this area, which will be sufficient enough in order to create this separation. The hydrogen will then get trapped in this area. This essentially allows infinite water storage for a water geyser, which obviously can be quite useful because water geysers tend to produce a lot of water. And we can also add more water manually to show this off. So I added 5,000 kilograms of water and it all gets drained into the infinite storage chamber. In my opinion, the water geyser paired with the waterfall method is the best way to use infinite storage techniques so you don't have to have a massive tank somewhere in your base to hold all of this water. So let's move on to gases. Gases work extremely similar to liquids, and if you've mastered the infinite storage for liquids, you can easily master the gases, because all you have to do is switch the substances when you're trying to displace tiles occupying gas vents. So in this case, we have a gas vent that's overpressured and a gas vent that's not overpressured. And of course, that is because the amount of oxygen in this chamber is 1200 kilograms. The gas vent overpressures at 2000 grams. So this is obviously way more than this one gas vent can handle. However, the bottom gas vent is going strong and it accepts all the oxygen that is thrown at it. And this is because the tile that is occupying the gas vent is actually a little bit of water. There's about 150 grams of water that is occupying this tile and all the other tiles down below, which means the gas vent will never be overpressured and it will never be flooded. So it will continue working indefinitely. Of course, the easiest way to do this would be to have a bottle emptier and just get one of your duplicates to drop a bottle of water or any other type of liquid. Again, you might want to use something like oil if you're storing very hot gases because eventually very hot gases may heat up your oxygen and turn it into steam. So just keep that in mind depending on what you're trying to store. Once your duplicates do that, you can operate this infinite storage chamber simply by starting the pump and gas. The final method that I'm going to show is the compression technique. The compression techniques works exactly the same with liquid or gases, but I'm going to show the liquids as it's slightly more complicated than the gases. And this is because we have to use the airflow tiles. There's no capacity limit for gases inside of your chamber, so there's no special technique required to store infinite gases, but there is for liquids. All of the liquids that will be subject to extremely high pressures have to be surrounded by airflow tiles. Essentially, we're going to be filling a top reservoir with water, or any other type of liquid that you're trying to store. And we're going to have four mechanized airlocks that are going to work together in order to compress the liquids down into the final chamber. If we go from top to bottom, we're going to start by opening the very top airlock. We're gonna call this one. The water drops down, then we're gonna open two, and then three. Once the water is at number three, we're close number one, close number two. Now, essentially, we've compressed the water into this two tile area. So now when we open number four, the water that we've compressed and the water that's already been held inside the reservoir get mixed together. Then we close number three and number four, and this compresses all of the water that we've collected into the chamber. We can turn the liquid shutoffs on at the very top and keep doing this over and over. One, two, three, back to one, two, four, three, and four. And now we've just stored all the water that we've collected above. But of course, nobody wants to do this manually each time they want to compress water. So we have some automation that can be hooked up that does this all for us. Automation works by using a timer sensor, which sends a momentary green signal that starts the action of the buffer gates. And then it's held idle with a red signal for 20 seconds. The timer sensor is connected to three buffer gates, which function on different time intervals to replicate the exact same signal switching that I was doing manually. Buffer gate number one is at four seconds, two is at eight, and three is at 12 seconds. The third buffer gate is also connected to a filter gate, and this delays the input for the last buffer gate that controls the very bottom mechanized airlock. This automation basically replicates exactly what I was doing manually, but it's far more efficient and it doesn't even use any power other than functioning the mechanized airlocks, which you don't need power for. I'm using power in this case just to speed up the process, but as you can see, it works perfectly fine if the mechanized airlocks are unpowered. So going over the buffer gates and the filter gate again, we have 4 seconds, 8 seconds, 12 seconds, 8 seconds, and 5 seconds. You can use basically any numbers that you like as long as they're in the same order that you see functioning on your screen. And this is the automation layout. So I hope that you enjoyed this tutorial on infinite storage methods in Oxygen Not Included. If you're not used to building infinite storage, it can be quite tricky to build, so I encourage you to practice in sandbox mode so you don't have to keep redoing it when you're trying to implement it to a real colony playthrough. Then you can kind of see what works and what doesn't without making a huge mess. If you enjoyed this video, and if it was informative or you were able to learn something, 
please feel free to leave a rating as this helps the video do better in the algorithm. And let me know down in the comments below if you plan to use infinite storage techniques in your playthroughs or if it's too much of a gray area for you to use. Regardless of what you decide, the main thing is that you're having fun with the game. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so as there are many more videos to come in the future. And until next time, I'm Ethan and I'll see you guys in the next one.